Johannesburg, ever-changing, often unpredictable, seldom boring. A young city founded by a greedy gold rush, Joburg has always been a bit rough around the edges. To some, she offers diversity and opportunity. To others, she's a fearful place where crime is out of control. The city's architecture reflects a century of racially driven social engineering resulting in extraordinary contrasts. Dazzling abundance is offset by extreme poverty. Glass and steel skyscrapers form a backdrop to squalid shanty towns as the gap between rich and poor widens. Joburg has the reputation of being the most dangerous city on earth and fear is everywhere. In the well-to-do suburbs, high walls, panic buttons, razor wire, electric fencing and armed response units have become standard features. The poor must fend for themselves. At dinner parties in bars, restaurants and homes around the city, people discuss how fear impacts on our collective psyche how it shapes our lives and our landscapes. Everyone has a story to tell. Obviously they move to Melville and they get broken in twice. And then they get burger proofing. Oh, the burger proofing doesn't work. Then they get an uh, alarm response. And then that doesn't work. And then maybe they start a street committee or something. So it's like a, a progression you know, before you deal with crime. You know, like you start slowly. The same thing with a car, central locking. This is the most bizarre place on the planet to be living at the moment. I had a gun pointed at me about a month ago. I was paying wages. And uh, I paid the first person. Next thing I saw, these guys running in with guns, waving. And telling everybody, sleep, sleep. And they took my payroll. <laughs> Fucking. <laughs> People in Johannesburg party like there's no tomorrow. Because there is a real sense that there may well not be any tomorrow. <laughs> I've been beggled four times. One time I was staring down the barrel of a gun. Somebody got into my house. I, I always have this beggar pass, and even if it's during the day, the doors are open, but I, I lock. Yeah. Because even if I go out, I think, oh, I'm in the, another room. I don't want to come back and find a stranger. I'm that scared in my very own house. I always thought South Africa's paranoid, but uh, I felt, wow, now, now I know why they're paranoid. Like having a gun pointed at you is like an active feeling, you know? Whenever I'm out, I'm seriously worried that somebody's in the house right now, or what's the time? So you find that I, I want to go out and attend a party, but once I'm there, I'm sitting depressed thinking about home. The only way I can go out is to have a guard from an armed reaction. We pay for private security. You know what happens to you when you arrive in Johannesburg from, as an outsider? Is everybody gives you the survival tips. Well, if I drive home, I make sure that there's nobody following me. You do not drive around with your windows open. If you do, you're stupid. You know, I lock my door, my, the door of my car. Uh, I don't drink and drive because that's what most of the time they get you. Somebody comes up to the car, go. I certainly wouldn't stop at red traffic lights if it was a quiet road. No, I think um, before you open your gates, just have a look who's in your street. You know, left, right. If I see people walking in the road that I don't know, I will also carry on driving and then come back to the property once I know that they've gone past. And as I was coming out at five in the morning, they tried to hijack my car. They just shot first, but nobody asks for your car. There's a bullet mark on the, on the bonnet. I was just gonna sell the house, but then I thought, you know, where do you go? You've got the same problem somewhere else. We're living in cages. Almost everybody in Joburg is living in cages now. You have to make sure that you're, you're tight, you're locked everywhere. You know, it's like, no, no freedom of the spirit. You can't, you can't be free. My house got a double roof on. I've got very double bars there in my windows. I've got an alarm system inside. Do you feel safe with all of that? No. Nope. When we talk about fear and perception, it's never one thing. It's never one group of people, and it's never one thing that they might 
fear. It's, it's a very complex and varied thing. Fear has, has been very much part of our, our society, actually. <laughs> Created um, through the old regime. And in terms of the built form, you see fear. Look at the high walls that surround us. Karen lives in an upmarket northern suburb. Like many mothers, she is concerned about the security of her family. I was invited through a friend of mine to go onto this anti hijack course. It okay. You don't have to stand up for <laughs> At first, I thought, oh no, I don't want to do it. And then I thought, well, maybe it will just be a good thing. You ready? Okay, hands up. That's it. Seatbelt. Excellent. Go. That's it. Handbrake. Okay. Hands up. That's it. Seatbelt. And there we are. Legs out. And hands out. And then just back off over there. Okay. I just pray every day that wherever myself or my family goes, that, that we will be kept safe and that we will be protected from bad and evil things. My my biggest concern is I drive with my kids all day. You know, I'm the one that mostly takes them to school, fetches them, takes them to sport. Bags? Come get your bags, let's go. So did you guys have a nice day? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What did you do? Test. I'm on my reformer. Did you? Mm. He's got a humongous gun. Shotgun? Like a shotgun and he's got bullets. If there was a hijacker, I'd just get out of the car. No, no questions asked. Stay in the car and keep going. Oh, 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 no, man. No. Somebody no. stopped them. Somebody ram into them. Yes. What are they doing to him? Call the police. What are they going to do? There. Oh, they try, I think they try to steal the headset or something. Somebody try to steal the headset. South Africans have lived with violence for years. So it's not, it's not a, a new talking point necessarily for, for all South Africans, but certainly for the middle classes, I think um, violence is, is more of a reality than it has been. I think that's my biggest fear, being attacked in the restaurant. Like, we've installed laser beams in the driveway. I try not to go to the bank. Everybody is an adrenaline pumping junkie. Why? Why do people seek artificial terror when it's part of our daily experience? <laughs> I mean, you never hear someone saying, I had these four guys in my house last night. They wanted to kill me and my whole family. What a rush! The development of the world's greatest gold fields were set in motion, as well as the creation of the largest mining city of all time, Johannesburg. The city centre was once home to prime retail property, a glittering symbol of white wealth. In the late 1980s, as the apartheid system crumbled, white business fled to the relative safety of the suburbs. When the stock exchange moved out, town seemed doomed. 
but the abandoned buildings attracted a new generation of immigrants who've changed the face of the city. It's a dynamic hub, yet crime and grime means that for many it's a virtual no-go zone, a perception that persists despite attempts to change it. Three men have been charged with murder after a hidden camera filmed them fatally shooting a man. A confusing sequence follows and ends with one of the suspects firing several shots. The victim died in the street as the perpetrators of the murder strolled casually towards a nightclub. You know, I must tell you, I don't go to town. Johannesburg, I don't. I'd rather go to the malls. I work in central Johannesburg and it's not... I mean, I, mean, I find Johannesburg, I feel safe in Johannesburg and I feel in all the suburbs. Business Against Crime has launched a 58-camera surveillance system in the city centre. With ambitions to expand the system to 350 cameras, the scheme has brought the crime rate down by about 40%. That we can patrol with cameras in seconds what it would take minutes if not hours to patrol on the ground. With a few people well placed, we are aiming at a response time from the time of the incident being reported to actual arrival on, on, on the scene of approximately 60 seconds. This side there's somebody selling a watch, this side there's somebody selling this and there's somebody else. We are afraid of town and town has lost its meaning. As night falls, the city becomes a fearful place. A space inhabited by criminals, the very brave, the very poor, and the security guards that we entrust with our lives. The northern areas surrounding the inner city used to be seen as upmarket suburbs, but as the lawlessness of the CBD spreads, these fault line areas are changing dramatically. You can't walk here with you. you know, this used to be one of the best places in Chalice to stay. My grandchildren stand this in a canvas to me anymore here. Yeah. Some residents have managed to sell their homes and move further north. Others have no choice but to live in their rapidly depreciating properties and fortify them as best they can. I was mugged at least three times here in Yovo. My, my daughter was hijacked. She was pregnant. I'm, I'm so aware almost all the time I'm walking around the street. My, my consciousness, my awareness is at peak. Sometimes you want to put on your headphones and just take a walk, you know, and just kind of clear your head. It's not a place you can do that. And that's like really sad because it's a beautiful place. Lisa Vetten, head of gender studies at the Center for the Study of Violence and Reconciliation, has researched public spaces that women find most unsafe. Public toilets are top of the list. I think the way that when we design urban spaces, for instance, really needs to be rethought. I mean, from my experience, it was the way bus stops had been designed, it was, the way, it was where ATMs had been situated that made them traps. And they create opportunities, I think, for crime. So I think it's really important when architects or urban designers are planning to think about how unintentionally they might be creating places that are very dangerous for people. The type of, of, of wall that we see going up in the suburbs is something that has uh, ended up creating very unsocial and also unsafe spaces. Members of my family have been raped, in fact, more than once, you know. Um, and it is, it is traumatic in the deepest sense, you know. You can lose your personal belongings, you can lose your personal stuff, you know, but as soon as, it's almost like you're losing your soul. I worry a hell of a lot less about cell phones, bags and, and that sort of thing than I do about rape. I mean, that is, that's the primary 
the primary fear that I have, particularly with HIV. Um, and that is what, what most, I think, what most South African women also fear. If I'm going to be in the street and I'm not in a car and I'm not in a big group, then I'm wearing big baggy jeans. You know, and my whole attitude kind of takes on shape as well. But my whole look says, touch me and die. It's not that someone comes into my house and steals my television. Yeah, no, they can it's come someone in that comes into thing. my house, ties me up, yeah. beats me up, rapes my, my girlfriend, ties her up, kills me, kills her, kills my children, kills my dog, whatever, to steal my television. If you want the television, come in, take it and fuck off. from thinking that fear only originated five years ago or started in 1994. It has its origins from the social system that was in place for many, many years. The people who were supposed to do policing were actually behaving like the military. And if we look at apartheid and the violence that came with apartheid, that was about brutalizing everyday life. Where you went to the toilet, where you, which bus you went on. Um, and I think that that sort of level of continuing brutalization in everyday aspects of life has continued in the way we live in our homes, in the fears we have on the streets. Whether it's about political transition, income inequality, rich and poor living side by side, single parent families, um, kids coming back from school, nobody at home, these are all the ingredients that people will write down on their list of causes for violence and for crime. If you put the whole list down, South Africa has all of those things. Photographer David Goldblatt often focuses his eye on the architectural forms of our country. A collection of his images are found in his book, The Structure of Things Then. I think in South Africa now, and in particular in Johannesburg and in uh, Gauteng, walls are very much um, uh, a defense against what we all fear. They divide us in very sharp and definite ways. Oh, there's always that question of an architectural identity. And the architectural identity in South Africa is, is, is basically not there. You cannot enjoy the beauty of architecture by first having to look through or over a wall, you know. So, along with these walls, we are building an architecture that I find quite horrifying, frankly. To the sort of the higher walls has the impact of cutting us off, but also maybe contributing to our fear at times. The area of Santon is a very good example of how space is being used. You're creating an environment for where it's a, it's a hijacker's dream. Big closed shopping centres with highways streaking past. These are not the kinds of spaces that people want to occupy publicly. You get in your car, you drive to a shopping centre and you're in an enclosed space with security. I don't know, I quite enjoy them all because it's all under one roof. One more. Yeah. yeah, I'm gonna scan the face. I'm gonna scan this one. What is it? Please support. I've just got keys, yeah. Oh, no, no, no gun, no nothing, okay. no. Can you go? Yeah, you can go to here. One of the most visible and contentious trends in the northern suburbs has been the closing off of public streets to form secure enclaves with controlled access.
Road closures have brought residents into conflict with local authorities, who are still trying to formulate responses to the flood of applications they receive. I think the boom's going up all over the place, you know. You're signing in to get into a street. <laughs> we love this area. We've been here for 10 years. There's a nice mix of people here, but we are just two blocks down from Louis Botha. They had a number of uh, crimes happening here, hijacking, break-ins, people being threatened at gunpoint. Rather than leave, what we wanted to do was stay here but protect ourselves as best we could. And we thought that uh, closing off the neighborhood would be the most preferable alternative. And it's worked incredibly well. You have to circumvent this thing all the way around Louis Bosco this way or that way simply because they've boomed off the area. The, the road closures in the, in the, in the suburbs most of them are illegal. And people just go ahead and close off. We have no less than 220 in a local authority in the Greater Johannesburg. That has received applications to want to barricade themselves. You've got to go to the gas department, to the electrical department, to the roads people, uh, to the police, to the traffic department, uh, to the parks and recreation department. Um, to get permission. The basic human right of freedom of association and space is being infringed upon by a minority because it can afford to pay for these very expensive security systems. The government's not doing anything. The police are they're trying their best, but truly they are swimming upstream. So they can do very little. So as a result, People have to help themselves. It's mostly, you know, my daughter that I'm worried about, leaving her alone in the car for the few minutes that you have to. So that fear has been alleviated. It's a basic human right that you should not be scared when you come home at night. Crime is real. It's not a figment of our imaginations. Our area, our little suburb, has become one of these fenced-off places. And, you, and that's made a difference. I have to, I, against my own feelings and, and, uh, and uh, disgust almost. And we just feel safe and uh, because the weekend it closes and we just feel safer. Uh, the crime has dropped by about 60 percent. A great thing that has come out of this closure is that we've really become friends. I, mean, I think South Africa is such a fractured society that to believe that people can come together in a community and, and fight crime in a, in a communal way, I think is, is, is not true because the reality of the way that plays out is that how do you come together as a community is to exclude everybody else from your community. You put up gates around, you put up booms, you put up controls, you put guards there, whatever, and you all sit around going, we're a community, and as a community we're fighting crime. You're not. You're just actually making crime go somewhere else. You're not yeah, stopping it. you don't it. even know who your neighbor is. Exactly. Like all these booms uh, um, are just a modern lager. <laughs> you know, it's a society that's always been in a lager. Um, the, the lager of apartheid was 74% of police force doing what these guys are doing, looking after the white community. To the north of Johannesburg now, um, you don't simply buy a house, you buy into an estate. And this estate is a complete system of security. It guarantees you 24-hour protection. There are electrified walls surrounding the whole area, often many kilometers long. And these walls are patrolled. There is a gatehouse with, with high security. And no one passes who is not authorized or has not been approved by either the guards or by a resident. Uh, this is a typical environment in South Africa. It's uh, part of Centurion. It is an area where we get a shopping complex um, and then a huge piece of vacant undeveloped land in the middle that are quite run down with a lot of litter lying around. And right next to that we've got an exclusive security village with a golf course inside, a lot of other facilities and all these nice houses in a protective environment that's from one community will end up having small pockets 
of people who are barricading themselves. And at the end of the day, we'll have something worse than apartheid. I don't feel like every time I cross a certain belt into another region, I should feel apologetic about it. I'm entitled to be here. I'm entitled to be wherever the hell I feel like I want to stop. Only yesterday I stopped in front of someone's yard in Orange Grove. You know, he was just busy doing his things in his car and whatever, his gates were wide open, and I stopped to make a call, you know? And it's just, close the gates, quickly. They look at you. Yeah. Sometimes with an absolute look of a shriek of panic, you know? Lock this door and lock that door. <laughs> it's the Macarena, you know. <laughs> um, so it's, it's prejudice. I mean, if, um, if every black person assumed that every white person is a racist, it wouldn't be okay. So why assume every black person is a, is a, is a criminal? It happens everywhere. When you hear people putting racial labels onto crime, they're generally creating this picture that the perpetrators are black and the victims are white. Um, and that's that's not true. Um, you know, the majority of victims are young, black, South African. As a young person, I always wanted to live here. I always thought, wow, what a beautiful place. But as I grew up, I realized that it's soulless. It's just nice and quiet, but there's no life in the streets. Where I come from, you see people. Placed far beyond the mine dumps, Soweto is never meant to be a permanent part of the city. But the two million people who do live here have made it home. Known for its political struggles as much as for high levels of violence and crime, Soweto is vibrant and gritty, a complex place with its own set of rules. Yes, yes, we are, yes because yes. we can't even stand a mm. child, your own child to the shops. We can't even stand that child to the shops. At night, you are exposed to all these dangers, rape, kidnapping, or being killed. Sophie Matlebe, living in Orlando, West Extension. As from 1960, I've been staying in this house. Things have changed in this area. Because at first when he started taking it, he said that this was the most sweetest suburb that you could get in Soweto. Crime is everywhere. It's not in the township alone. It's everywhere. But do you feel that it's increasing in the township? Yeah, it isn't increasing. Day by day. Day by day. People are being robbed, hijacked their cars with guns and everything. Presently, we are definitely disturbed by the high increase of hijacking, car hijacking. We do have rape, murder, robbery. My son was mad at the empty space there when that one person coming this way. I'm scared of people getting into the house and say that I must lie down and then demand money from me. That's what they do. I would build a higher wall than this. I'm even not satisfied because of this that they can still jump in between us. The magnitude of crime has taken very high proportions, where people are no longer afraid to go into a school and murder a teacher and do whatever they want to do. If you go to surround the uh, children with barbed wire and uh, uh, bars on doors, it's the, it's the side of the times. The only way that we can manage crime is to involve the community because we're talking about criminals who are from the community. They are my, our 
brothers and sisters, some of our parents. We are afraid of them, they are always having guns and knives. You can't just simply speak roughly with them. You can't scold them. You must always, and yet these are children, youngsters. In Umfulo, a group of friends meet at the Obsessions Hair Salon. Once again, the topic turns to crime. Scared as white people are in the suburbs, as scared as uh, some black people are in the suburbs. You're also scared. But no. You're also scared. Like, like if, it's, if, it's, if you see four, four, four males walking in and coming in towards you, I suggest you better turn back. And I feel like, well, I mean, it's bad sometimes. You, you, You've compromised uh, your money to buy a car and somebody comes and take it just again. Kita ka vaka lo chisele ta ka kamota sa di transine. Ka chisele. Ka bona. Nyo ga ti yetsa mo. Ki pinas. Ah. Ke try lo ba grand e mara no ke. Nyo go e tla hanya. Ba tho. So. Ka mo di mo fi a o ka mo di mo bo. Fe tu e ba grand. Tu ka mo ka o ka. O che bo. Respect and mo ki tla na mo va. Mo sa re ke problem ma re su a. The police they can teach you how to be more of a criminal. There was a police van. I approached them. Hey, they took my phone. What they said to me? Hey, yes, we got what? During their duty, they do a lot of cash for themselves. So it says that someone comes and robs your shop. Instead of going to the police, how do people deal with it in the community? What did you do? We get him. We beat the head out of him. Trust the police? Not very much. They are also involved in the crime. I don't trust the police. You don't know where to turn to. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm definitely optimistic, yeah, that we are going to, to, to win it. In March this year, Superintendent Richard Luvengo was arrested along with six of his colleagues on charges related to fraud and corruption. He was suspended from the force. We people are looking out for each other. On the other side of the city is Dipslut, an informal settlement that's growing daily. A dumping ground for people moved in from crowded areas elsewhere. There are almost no services for an estimated 140,000 people. The nearest police station is 50 kilometers away. Residents have to rely on their community police forum, which operates out of a caravan. Now we talk to the community, we give the police information how we have discussed with the community. Sometimes you find that the police have arrested the wrong person, then we have to release that person and give them the right person, because we've got the right information. Can you walk around any time? Surely yeah, we do. walk around if you're safe? I think, I, I think the CPF is working, it's good. In so it's I can walk in the night, here I can walk. I've been threatened to be killed, but I said, this is what I know uh, best. I still believe that, uh, well, I've saved a lot of people's uh, lives. I'm proud for that. Private security in Deep Slut comes in the form of the local branch of the vigilante group Mopojo Matamaja. We do, to my side, I don't think CPF is working very nice. So that's why we're getting a lot of people that are, that are bringing the, the, the complaints to Mopojo Matamaja because there's no CPF anymore. But they, 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 their place is still there. But when you're going, all the time you don't get somebody there inside. Mapoko Matamaka help people like maybe a young girl like me did something wrong. Then if, if your parents go to them, I think they'll, they'll beat you and they'll beat you to death. 
they are very dangerous. Yes. Sometimes they, they don't want to tell the truth, so we beat them until he tells, he tells the truth that yes, I did this and this and this. In 1999, three years after it was started, the organization claimed 35,000 members in 80 branches across the country. Authorities mostly turn a blind eye to the often illegal activities of these self-styled crime fighters. And then when we can meet somebody outside once, when you find him one day, he say, hello, hello, my sister. He just give you a good respect. Good, good. <laughs> Because vigilantes, if maybe you deal with them face to face, then you will end up uh, making uh, uh, like like a, a, a mini war around uh, around here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then we wish that one day government we can give us permission to work this job, yes. to train us. In our society, we will see people acting in, in very horrific ways. Be they the vigilante group who set someone alight or the. Uh, the way someone chooses to protect themselves, you know, they put a blaster on the side of their BMW to, to fry somebody. As a society, we come from a place where we only see violence as a way to solve, solve our problems. If somebody's in my head and they have no business to be there, yes, they should be killed. I, I, it's very strange, I'm all the contradictions, but when it comes to my property, my house, my safety, I've come to think that way. I think we've lost track of what fear really is. I don't think we know what it is. I think that fear of crime is not, it's not always based on the real risk, but it doesn't mean that, that it should be dismissed. A week later, I think I was driving home, it was six o'clock, winter night, dark, and I had a, an absolute freak out panic attack that everybody was following me. And they were, because we were all going in the same direction, but it was like, what are they following me for? <laughs> yes. That jolt you get in your stomach when you think somebody's coming up behind you, that sort of sick feeling, never quite goes away. And I, I had nightmares recurring all the time. So basically that safe place, that sort of belief you have in the world, has suddenly been pulled from underneath your feet. And every time I'd walk out after sunset was terror. You feel helpless, you feel afraid, you feel scared all the time. You feel vulnerable, you think it's going to happen to you again. I go to bed at night, I lock my front door, I put my alarm on and I lock my bedroom door. Every night when we're all ready to go to bed, once I've done all the locking up, this is my last gate that I lock. Um, this is security gate in the passage and once I do that, I go into the bedroom and I arm the alarm. There are two kinds of fear. There's what I call the necessary fear and then there's the toxic fear. If you're scared of a crime, and wherever you are, you're worrying about being attacked. Just that worry will wear out your spirit. I sleep with my gun. It's such a way now that my knees are going to start to get trouble. What's upsetting you so much right now? Can you explain it? Feeling uh, machtelous. I think that if you're going to be happy in this world, you better learn to make friends with your fear. But I should have scared. Got nothing at my life. So you see these walls? These are the people who have the reason to, to fear, not me. A few months later, we caught up with Peter again. Having grown up in Johannesburg, it was, I think I became very lax because I've always been streetwise. I mean, it was the first time in my life that I'd had an experience like that. I walked from Times Square, two blocks up, and suddenly I was confronted by two young guys. They cocked a gun at, and pointed it at my chest. It was actually on my chest. So, and it took me a while to realize it's, it's a robbery, it's a crime, because I thought it should be cops, because the only person who's ever pulled a gun on me is a cop. And my stuff was taken, my wallet, my bag, with my computer disks in it, my work and I realized that I got away with my life. And that also made me angry, that I should feel relieved that I got away with my life in my country. I don't think um, it was a good experience. I still feel the same so many months later. I still feel scared, really. I'm much, much more careful, and I'm more suspicious of people than I normally would be, which is sad because I love people. 
we are now faced um, and up against on a daily basis with major crime syndicates, um, one could almost say mafia type operations. South Africans are rapidly becoming experts at security. We visited SecureX, a showcase for the security industry's products and innovations. Please get off my property or you might have some serious consequences awaiting you. Please get off my property or you might have some serious consequences awaiting you. It works with a little microchip. My private one is inside that little watch strip. It's for an emergency safe of one handgun. Recognizes the chip. You press and the gun comes into your hand. It pops out. This system over here is a fully integrated security system. In other words, from a single hand control like that, you can open your electric gates. You can drive up further, turn on the lights just off the single remote control. Have a quick heart attack, call some medical uh, attention. Once the light comes back onto it, it will fluoresce. In the event of a robbery where a firearm is stuck against your head, do not do the fighting. As I said, hand over the briefcase. He runs all to the In my house, I've probably got 30 panic buttons around the house. I believe you've got to be able to go to a panic button that's probably half a second away from you. Right. I can see nothing inside there, so I cannot steal anything. The razor wire uh, has developed in South Africa was originally uh, a military strategic installation. There's almost nobody in South Africa who has not an interest in the product for their own use somewhere. We recognize that razor wire can be an eyesore. What we were doing was uh, to color code it, particularly a forest green, it blends into the surrounding vegetation. That's the wire that was being used in the 70s to keep away the youth in the townships from coming into the cities. If I sort of cast my mind back, I think that the fear that many whites had during the years of apartheid was that this system would eventually result in a night of the long knives that black people would eventually reach a point of total intolerance of the system, that they would rise in rebellion and whites would be killed en masse. And the Night of the Long Knives didn't happen. So there was a huge sigh of relief. But now you have the Night of the, of the uh, Pistol. Obviously, um, as one private security operator put it, um, crime is good business. I will be done on SSPs in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And we give us our trace passes. Give us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. At the moment, the industry is worth about 13 billion per year. There are more than 5,000 individual security companies registered. It's two private security guards to every policeman, and then when it comes to visible police, two visible security guards, it's five to one. Attention! You can say it's based on a paramilitary style, in the sense that 
as far as the marching, uh, any any kind of drill installs discipline. Clive Zilberg started Stallion Security 10 years ago with four men and a truck. Unlike many fly-by-night security companies, Stallion's solid reputation has grown and the company now employs over 1,500 guards. Being a family man in South Africa, a family man and a businessman, um, we've chosen to stay in this country. Um, crime in South Africa is bad, um, there's, there's no doubt about it, but I think it uh, overtakes people. I think people get um, too overcome by fear. But I think there's a lot more positiveness um, in this country than, than, than just the crime. Like most security guards, Jabulani Maloleke works a six-day week for 12 hours a day. He earns about 1,700 rand a month, supporting his brothers and sisters who are still at school. It is better to get that money than to, get to rob people, you see. <laughs> Almost every Saturday, I'm betting Lutu. Maybe I can grab those millions. I'd be quite surprised if they actually laid their lives on the line for that. For a thousand rand, to hell with that. And the Defence Minister clears up the controversy surrounding VIP pictures used for target practice. It's 8 o'clock, a very good evening to you. A countrywide strike by security guards turned violent Chaos in Johannesburg Chaos has erupted today. at Johannesburg's Protesting Library Gardens, where striking security guards have attacked their colleagues. The police intervened to save on-duty security officers who were being assaulted. The guards won the battle, securing a maximum of 55 working hours a week. Despite winning better wages, an untrained guard still earns a minimum wage of about 3 rand 67 cents an hour, while a cash and transit guard earns about 10 rand an hour. The role of the police in any democracy is to, is to ensure that the democracy is upheld. We cannot afford a country run by private armies. It's my belief that there, that there certainly isn't enough um, control over, over private security, that a lot, of, a lot of control up till now has been quite self-regulatory. Most of the guards are now armed and there isn't sufficient training and sufficient legislation and checks and balances to deal with that. People always say, the first thing they say to you when they come to the police station, what are you doing? You're doing nothing about crime. I never see you, but they never see the police because they hide behind these huge walls. So what do you think is an alternative? Break down the walls. This is, this is the type of wall I would suggest to people. It's high, but you still can see through. They are more than 20 people. But, you know, for, for real communities to become functional, you need open doors, open streets, free access, and a lack of fear. You look at uh, particularly monuments, the, uh, the Stradum Monument in Pretoria is I mean, this is really, this is, this is fascist architecture, um, meant to glorify the, uh, the leader and the state. As we continue to plan and develop our cities, we must move away from that kind of architecture. The architecture of aggression, the architecture of domination, we must move towards an open, free, transparent architecture that talks to us, but not an architecture that frightens us. When South Africa broke away from the monarchy in the Commonwealth in 1961, people had mixed feelings. Some welcomed the decision. There you have the damage. You can see the Stradom Square has collapsed. The roof, it looks like, and the whole uh, monument area has collapsed and uh, fallen through into the parking area. We've recorded quite a bit of footage and we'll play that for you. Architecture of freedom would involve a type of space making that would encourage all cultures to have a sense of 
ownership of the spaces they live in. It's about seeing children having a freedom of the, the streets and of the roads. And when the world comes tumbling down Taking us 10 years, 20 years down the line. Sydney, <laughs> this is a 10 to 20 year burn. We're not going to wake up uh, 1st of January 2001 or 1st of January 2002 and all of a sudden have a Switzerland here. Not going to happen and don't expect it to happen. An ideal Joburg for me would be a place where I won't have to be like scared all the time. We all have to take personal responsibility. I know exactly who, who lives in my building and exactly know who lives in my street, which has made a better thing for me because now I can walk in the street and I can talk to the kids, I can be friendly to the kids. So I feel like I belong to something. What is required is that individuals and groups and institutions in this country should genuinely want to change things in the country. And that's the only way people knock down their walls, sleep well at night, get up in the morning, drive to your local shop without anybody wanting to take your car. It's as simple as that. Why barricade yourself away behind your home? Go out, reclaim the streets, reclaim your public spaces and your private spaces. I mean, there are. I mean, there'll never be more criminals than there is us. Stand proud, walk tall. If you're gonna live, then live. Sometimes um, one has to work at um, maintaining one's humanity. So I could tell you all the stories about my life, catch your breath underneath the satellite of air. They used to call me the preacher, but what can I teach ya? I don't live with the things that you do, you're fearless. You're so fearless, you're fearless. The more you think, the less you know about your soul. The man's got a cowardly step towards the things she said. He said the hands that grabbed crime rates. The scalped dreamed up primates that hunted, caught, cooked, seasoned, and ate up these high stakes. Fuck being a victim, fear is not my fate.